Welcome to the program. My guest is Kristen Zekas. She is a member of the Charlottesville City Council. Kristen, welcome back to the program. Thank you very much. So uh, Charlottesville City Council made news again recently. Uh, just a few days ago, it was uh, voted a 3-2 vote mm -hmm. to endorse a proposal to offer for sale uh, a certain statue in a certain park. Yes. W what's, what's going on? Well, it, it's actually, in a way, not news. It's something we decided to do a couple of months ago, and we asked the council, or we asked the staff to come back to us with suggestions about how to go about removing uh, Mr. Lee from the park downtown. Um, and the, the suggestions that they gave us really um, amounted to auctioning it, selling it, or donating it. Right. And this, for those who are just joining us, this is a statue of Robert E. Lee, Confederate general, on his horse traveler in Lee Park uh, in the heart of downtown Charlottesville, just a block, a couple of blocks off of the Charlottesville Downtown Mall, installed, unveiled in 1924. Yes. And, um, and why are we having this conversation about options of what to do with this statue? Well, um, you know, part of it is cost, that you know, we on council have voted that we don't want it in the park anymore, and so um, if, we are t if we were to move it, it would cost some money. Um, we've set aside $300,000 just for the kind of worst possible scenario, but it wouldn't cost near that just to move it. Um, but what we're hoping to do is that somebody, um, either with a museum or with some sort of educational center, or perhaps a battlefield somewhere, um, would like to use it in a way to, um, you know, a, in, as historical interpretation, which is an appropriate use for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And would pay for the at least the moving costs. Yeah. Do we know what that cost is? Did staff Not exactly. spec that out at all? No, well, it, it's hard to tell you know, yeah. because it would matter how far it's going. You don't know where it's going. Right. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and this, of course, has been incredibly controversial for a while now because, uh, you know, it was a few years ago when you floated the idea, hey, and, and all you were doing was floating the idea of a conversation, yes. hey, maybe we should have a conversation about Confederate monuments in public parks in the 21st century. Yes. And the vitriol that immediately came back to you for just suggesting a conversation which is, you know, a pretty innocent thing in a, in a society that should be a, a democratic republic that relies on those kind of public conversations of, you know, touchy issues. Well, I think it's really opened a lot of people's eyes to how much of a, of a real symbol those are to people who are, um, you know, deeply committed to the cause of the South and the Civil War. Um, not to say that they are, you know, pro-slavery, but that they really feel that the wrong side won and that, um, that the North was overreaching and that the South was fighting for its freedom um, and that those figures, the generals who, who, were, who led the, the rebellion against the United States of America, um, were the real heroes in the story. Right. And they should continue to be honored with these older statues yes. that were put up in the early 20th century. Well, and, and the statues were put up long after the Civil War. They were not um, intended for the most part as war memorials. They were really, um, you know, kind of tributes to a particular cause. Right, right. Um, and so, you know, there's nothing on the statue itself that says to the war dead or anything like that. It's, it's actually don dedicated to the donor's parents. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it really is a symbol of this, you know, the South will rise again. Yeah. It is a white supremacist statement on the landscape 60 years after the war. It is. Yeah, and that's been a tough, as I try to explain this to people, that's been the toughest part because the people who still embrace the symbolism and, uh, and, and want to literally venerate and celebrate the U.S. Confederacy, um, that's, that's a part they, they can't see or refuse to see, that this statue has a certain meaning when it went up in 1924. It was absolutely a white supremacist, uh, pro-Confederate statement. Yes. And, you know, it's really interesting that we, most of the, the most negative feedback we've gotten has not been from people in Charlottesville. Um, the most kind of vitriolic responses that we've gotten have been from places like Ohio and Arkansas and Florida. Um, people all over the country who see every single statue of Robert E. Lee as sacred. Um, right. And so somehow by you know, saying that we're going to move it to somewhere else, um, they feel very personally threatened and feel that we're somehow attacking their heritage and, and their ancestors who fought in the war. You can't change history and, and, and we all hate this. the yeah. South and we should leave. And, um, 
you know, both Mr. Bellamy and I grew up in the South. Um, Fellow city councilor. Yes, yeah. who, who both kind of really advocated for this position. And so, you know, it's not a Southern hating thing at all. In fact, it really is a love for the South that makes me feel so strongly about these statues. Right, to want to see the South finally shed the, the weight, I'm looking for words here, the weight and the, the uh, anxiety of influence, the hindrance that is that lost cause. Yeah. Well, Mr. Lee himself, after the war, did a lot of work kind of trying to repair the, the breach, um, trying to heal the nation. And I, I'll, I'll give him that, he really did a lot of work in that area. And one of the things that he said in a letter was, you know, urged people not to erect statues um, to the South or to Confederate heroes after the war. He said it would keep open and fester the wounds of war. And we see that it really has. Yeah. Now, the Robert E. Lee statue in Lee Park has been the, the subject, the, 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 really the focal point of this effort. But there's also a Stonewall Jackson statue yes. just a few blocks away. And right around the corner from the Stonewall Jackson statue, there's the 1909 uh, anonymous Confederate soldier. It, the, the, uh, the official name of that statue when it was unveiled was called At the Ready. Mm -hmm. And it shows an anonymous soldier with a gun in hand, ready to go into battle to fight for the preservation of human slavery in America. Indeed. That particular statue is on county property, so it's not ours to decide. Um, that one I actually have a little less issue with, um, despite the very overtly Confederate statements on its side. Um, one is that it was a little earlier. Um, it really is a monument to the war dead and says so. Right. Um, and also, unlike a lot of the, the, those statues are kind of colloquially, colloquially called Johnny Reb, um, yeah, and they're yeah. in, in southern cities all over the south. But um, most of them face north, and they're called at the ready because they're protecting their towns from the, the, the northern horde who may come again. Right. But ours actually faces south um, and is you know, looking toward home. And to me, that's a little less aggressive stance. And I'm, you know, I'm, I know that, that there are people who feel very strongly about it. Um, that one bothers me less than the other two. Yeah. What about Stonewall Jackson? Another, like Lee, sure. on his horse. Indeed, yeah. glorifying the cause. Right. Um, the only reason that I have focused my attentions more on, on Robert E. Lee, um, well, first of all, he was the, the main general of the Confederacy, so he was the leader of the troops who fought for the Confederacy. Um, Stonewall Jackson was under him. Um, but also, the Stonewall Jackson statue a is a better piece of art. It was, it's a beautiful statue, but that wouldn't do it for me. But it's also behind a grove of trees. It's away from the street. And so as people are driving by, Less it doesn't your command face. the landscape. Yeah. It is problematic if you think about people going to court um, to, you know, to get justice in the, in the court system if you're an African-American defendant or plaintiff for that matter. Um, because it's on courthouse grounds. It's on the courthouse right. grounds. And you look over there and you think, what kind of justice am I going to get in a community that still venerates that? Yeah, and arguably, Kristen, the same way of thinking, the same calculus that went into the thinking about Robert e, the Robert E. Lee statue could directly be applied to Stonewall Jackson at, at any point in the future. Sure. Well, they were, they were dedicated by the same person around the same time for the same reasons. Yeah, and those same reasons, I want to circle back to that because I, I really do think that's critical. Think about the year that in Charlottesville they gather to pull the drape off of this statue of Robert E. Lee. It's 1924. We've seen a resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan. We've seen a, a, a mini civil rights movement after World War I mm -hmm. as soldiers of color are returning from the war to their hometowns in the South after having been in Paris and in Europe um, and, and seeing a different approach to race relations. In, in many respects. You've also got the NAACP, which is still relatively new at that period and is winning cases in courts, in the Supreme Court, to protect the rights of African Americans and, and previously marginalized peoples in our democracy. And, and then you see Lee. Also in 1924, you have Virginia adopts the Racial Integrity Act, yes. the Sterilization Act. I mean, this is when you see the full force of government power coming down hard on the rights and liberties of African Americans. Well, a lot of white Southerners really felt that Reconstruction um, had kept them from being able to um, recover after the war. You know, there were hundreds of thousands of people died in that war. It was devastating, um, both in the North and the South. Yeah. Um, 
But I think the Reconstruction made it difficult for white Southerners to kind of gain back the, the economic power they had had. And that was its intention, um, because it was supposed to allow for the economic empowerment of, of black Southerners. Right. Um, and so as, you know, as we got on in time toward um, when the federal government stopped enforcing Reconstruction, and there was a huge backlash across the South, and things like the Racial Integrity Act, things like the Ku Klux Klan, lynchings across the South, um, really gained ascendancy during that period. And 1924 is sort of the end of that period, that the real violence of that period, partly because there was a delay in, in construction of the statue. The, the original sculptor died, and so it, it came later than it was I never knew that. Wow, that's interesting. Um, but there still was a burning of a cross on Browns Mountain to celebrate the unveiling. Um, the Ku Klux Klan did march down Market Street to celebrate the, the unveiling of, of, of the this statue. particular statue. Yes. So have you been surprised, Kristen, at, at the reaction we've seen from this conversation, the reaction from the 3-2 vote? Has it, what, what has surprised you about it? Because well, I'm sure you yeah. expected the, sure. the heated conversation. Well, having spent my childhood as a child of the Civil Rights Movement in Mississippi, um, I can't say I was surprised by the, the real neo-Confederate rage about this decision. That, that didn't surprise me. What has surprised me is that, and, and there are fewer and fewer of them I find over the last year, but the people who still say, you know, it's just a statue. It doesn't really mean anything. It's a pretty horse. Just leave it there. As if it has no other meaning and if, if that meaning doesn't matter. And I, I believe that that meaning does matter um, and that we really need to respond to that in some way. And, right. and you know, there was talk about confronting it in place and that's you know certainly worth trying with the Jackson statue but I think with something as dominant to the landscape as the Robert E. Lee statue um, removal is really the only way I, I can see to, to, to stop Charlottesville from telegraphing that message that that's something that we venerate here. Yeah. Let's do this. Let's take a quick break and when we get back I want to ask you about the the city now faces a court case. People mm -hmm. are suing to try to keep Robert E. Lee on his horse in the park in Charlottesville. We're talking with Kristen Zakos of the Charlottesville City Council. Stay with me. We'll be right back. Welcome back. We're talking with Kristen Zakis. She's a member of the Charlottesville City Council, and they continue to make news with steps they're taking now to sell the historic 1924 statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee that has been uh, for generations now on display in a public park in downtown Charlottesville. Kristen, uh, one of the recent headlines is that there's a lawsuit. Yes against the city. Who has brought this lawsuit and what's the intention? Well, there's a whole bunch of people. Um, there are people who have enjoyed the statue in their community and are, are filing because they will lose that enjoyment. There are people who are veterans who consider that this is somehow a, a monument to veterans because um, after the Civil War, Confederate mo veterans were considered veterans um, by the United States government. Um, there are some people who are uh, members of the, I don't remember if it's the Daughters of the Confederacy, but one of the groups that helped raise money for the statue. Um, there are, you know, so various categories of people are, are all together suing us. So I don't, there are several um, plaintiffs, I'm not sure right. exactly how many. And, and what are the nuts and the bolts of that? How does it, how does it work? How does something like that play out? Well, it's, it's, in the court now, um, they have filed a, a request for an injunction, which would be the judge saying, 
don't do anything until we've decided that yeah. you know, it would keep us from being able to move forward. Um, we have um, issued a, a counter uh, motion saying to dismiss the case because it doesn't, um, it, the, either they don't have standing, I'm not sure exactly what yeah, the wording yeah. is, um, or, or the law does not support their claims. Right. So that's where we are now. We're waiting for a hearing on those two motions. What about the, it wasn't there legislation in Richmond? I mean, the, there, there's some kind of court case there as well that, that Richmond telling communities across Virginia, you can't touch those Confederate statues. You have to leave them there. Well, there was a, an attempt by the le legislature uh, a couple of years ago um, looking to make that, to, to close a loophole in that law and the governor vetoed that, so that did not happen. Um, the law that was there before is about war memorials, and it says that counties, it originally said that, that counties could erect more, war memorials, and having erected them could never take them down again um, to any war. And the, the law later changed it to apply to cities, but because it wasn't, in, it wasn't applicable when this memorial, well, actually it's not a memorial, but when this statue was put up, um, there is an argument that it doesn't apply to us. Um, and that's what the legislature was trying to close that the governor vetoed. Um, I would argue that it's not a war memorial and so it doesn't even come under that law, but that's for the judge to decide. Yeah. What's your response, Kristen, to those who are looking at this whole conversation and saying, you know, what's the big deal? It, it, it's a horse, it's a, it's a statue, it's been there forever. It's, you know, it truly, you're, you're, you liberals in Charlottesville are making, this crazy issue out of nothing. Don't you have anything better to do on city council? We certainly hear that. Well, fortunately, we can multitask, so we can do more than one thing at once. So we've been doing this. We've been doing a lot of other things, too. So it's, you know, it's not an either or, fortunately. Um, I think that you know, when people talk about the divisiveness of it, this certainly has unearthed a lot of divisiveness. And it, it's certainly opened up um, and kind of to public view some of the, the, the very different opinions about these, these statues. And I think that a lot of people find that, um, that open discussion of these issues very uncomfortable. Um, I think that the divisions were not, had not disappeared. There, there have always been divisions. And I, I talk to um, you know, people, you know, every couple of days someone will say, you know, I never brought my children to that park. Um, African-American residents of Charlottesville. Yeah. I always knew I wasn't welcome downtown, so I never came downtown when I was young. Um, you know, that, that statue, not to everyone, and there are African-American residents of Charlottesville who, who like the statue and, and are fine with it being there. You know, there's no monolith in any right, population. Right. Um, but I think that for a lot of people, it really has, the fact that it stayed there this long has really signified to them that, that their views were not, that didn't matter. Yeah. Um, and, that, and they've, you know, for the most part, learn to keep pretty quiet about it because that, you know, it's, it's something that, that does bring up very strong feelings right, and very right. aggressive feelings. Well, I've been confronted by people who've said there was, you know, there was never a problem with this statue until now. And number one, I say, well, anybody who might have had a problem with it in 1924 knew not to say anything because Indeed. if they spoke up, they could be lynched. I mean, that was a very real possibility. And as well as the fact that, you know, I've been a reporter in this town for almost 30 years. I was familiar with this. I've talked to people back in the early 90s who had a real, you know, African Americans in Charlottesville who had a real problem with these Confederate monuments that, <laughs> that celebrate and venerate the U.S. Confederacy, which wanted to, let's remind people, which wanted to create a nation on American soil that by its constitution would require states to keep alive human slavery in America. I mean, it wasn't about states' rights because the states didn't have the right to not have human slavery. They would be required in the U.S. Confederacy. And when Virginia entered that war and Charlottesville chose to join the Virginia, you know, the Confederacy, A, a lot of white Charlottesville residents joined the Union Army at that time. Um, but more than half of our population locally was enslaved, was African American. And they certainly would not have voted for that had they had the vote, but they didn't. Right. And so when we talk about you know, the South choosing, or Virginia choosing to join the Confederacy, it was a very small subsection of Virginia that chose to join the Confederacy. Yeah. What's your response, Kristen, to those who say this is a mighty slippery slope? It's Robert E. Lee today, it's Thomas Jefferson tomorrow. I mean, where, where does it end? 
Well, for me, those are really apples and oranges. Um, in this particular statue, just speaking of the Robert E. Lee statue, um, it's not about who Mr. Lee was as a man. Like I said, after the war, he, he really worked to heal divisions, and a lot of people admire him for that. If he were standing there in his suit coat, healing those divisions after the war, it would be a totally different question. But what's being celebrated in this particular statue, in this particular park, is the general of the Confederacy, astride his horse in uniform, leading the, the forces of the Confederacy to uphold the institution of slavery and to divide the country and to leave the Union um, in, in a war, basically, against the United States. And so you know, that is not what we celebrate Thomas Jefferson for. Uh, we celebrate him for very pro-American ideals and the things that he wrote and said and tried to do. Yes, he was a flawed person. Yes, he owned slaves. I don't celebrate that. We don't put statues of him up with a whip with his slaves. That's not what we celebrate. That's a great point. It's a great point. And you mentioned, um, with the time that we have left, you mentioned multitasking. And you recently announced that you would not be seeking a third term yes. on city council, which has become something of a political tradition in mm -hmm. Charlottesville to serve two terms and then step aside and let other members of the community seek, seek to, serve, to serve in that way and to, to serve on city council. Looking back, you'll serve in office until the end of this calendar year. Yes. But take a moment to reflect back on, on some of the work that you've been engaged in what are the headlines? What are the key takeaways? How do, how do you understand sure. Charlottesville in a way perhaps that you didn't before you were on city council? Well, I'll say that when I ran for office, I had been working very, you know, a lot of time with the Obama campaign before that and had been knocking a lot of doors and talking to people and, and really became convinced that there were four main issues that, that we needed more attention to on city council. Um, that you know, the federal government can do some things about these things, but really that the city level is where these things get decided. One was equity in education, and looking at education not just as what the schools do, but how we support children for learning in our community and how kids have a fighting chance to do well in school and to succeed and go to college. Um, the second was affordable housing, which we know is a big issue here. Huge. Um, <laughs> another was um, living wage jobs. Um, to, to grow our economy in a way that was not just about low-wage jobs and to try to, to build kind of a, a stronger middle class. Right. And then the other piece was kind of who we listen to as a city and making sure that community engagement brought in all sectors of the population. Um, and so I guess the, the couple of the things on that, the latter point that I, I feel very proud of are the Youth Council, which brings in the voices of youth in a really strong and, and institutionalized way and the town hall meetings where city council and the, our lead team of, of staff go out into the community every month or so and meet with people in their neighborhoods over dinner with childcare so that we can really hear from folks about what the issues are before they reach crisis. Um, as far as those other three issues. And that's issues, been a positive experience. Uh, totally, yes. Reaching out and facilitating and making it easier for let's say whether it's youth or the poor, marginalized communities to be heard in local government. Yes. And we've, I think we've always been able to hear from some folks. You know, we've always had the people who, who have, you know, either don't have children at home or have the leisure to be able to, to come to a city council meeting and spend time there. And that's wonderful that they do that. Um, the you know, people who you know, will email us and know counselors personally and yeah, all that, yeah. that's always access. Um, but for a lot of people, you know, arguably the majority of people, uh, arguably the majority of people, black and white, not just low income. Of course, yeah. Um, it, it's, it seems, kind of impenetrable as a way, you know, how do you talk to people in, in the city? And so to have people come to your neighborhood and say, look, we're here to eat with you and to listen to you, it's a very different message than you can yeah. come if you want to and you have three minutes and then you have to stop. You know, I have covered so many city councils over the years in Charlottesville and I have always said to people when they, when they tell me, oh, they do their own thing, they don't, I know for a fact, going back decades, they do listen. Yes. There's not a council that hasn't truly listened. And I don't just mean hear, I mean listen. And it's really important to make sure that we know who we're listening to. Because if we're just listening to a subset of the people we knew before we came on council, we're not really listening. Yeah. And that's, if I think, why it's You're just listening to the important. chamber or North Downtown. Right. Yeah. Um, so it, that's why it's so important to figure out new ways to reach out, to listen to people who you didn't hear before. Yeah. And how does that change a city? When you, when you take steps as a leader in a community to be more inclusive, what's, what's the argument for it? 
I mean, there's a, there's a basic democratic ideal argument that all people should be engaged. Again, Jefferson, everybody should be yes. engaged. But what, in terms of practicalities and what you can see actually working in City Hall? Well, for one, I think that we have been able to hear about issues before they've become crises, um, whether it's traffic issues in certain neighborhoods or you know, housing issues. And I think it's helped us to be more proactive about those things. I think it's also good practice for people to come to a town hall meeting to get to speak, and then when there's something really up, you know, that, that they that's urgent for them, they know who we are, and they're not afraid to come and talk to us or email us or call us. Um, there's so already a familiarity. They, yeah, they've already kind of broken that original door, right, and, right. and they know how to find us. I only have a few seconds left, but just to leave people with this, for somebody who might be watching from outside the area. What's, what's the key to Charlottesville, you think? What's, what's, the, what's the key to understanding this city that most people might not know? I would say it's a wonderful place, perfectly situated in, in climate and, <laughs> and area, um, with a very complicated past um, that we still run into from time to time. And I think we are all of us committed to working through that and, and you know, coming together. Yeah. Kristen, thank you for being sure. here. I appreciate it. And thank you for your service to this community. Thank you very much. Kristen Zakos is a member of the Charlottesville City Council. You can find the complete archive of this program online at mediaandcitizenship.org. Have a terrific week, and you all be good to each other.